Welcome back. It's time for us to move forward into mapping as we get ready to produce maps from a simple station and offset topo survey and as we move a little further into radial topo using total stations. This will also, these concepts will also apply to what we do with GPS in the near future. To go along with this particular topic, I need you to read chapters 17 and 18 in Elementary Surveying 12th edition. Uh, those chapters are entitled Mapping Surveys, Mapping Surveys, and Mapping. A lot of good information in there, fairly well put, and my intent with this lecture is to supplement what you read there with oh, a little bit larger perspective as a surveyor and an engineer giving you all some uh, professional professional advice, professional outlook toward uh, putting the knowledge you're gaining here to work in the first few years of your career. There are a handful of surveys that we do to support engineering design. And this is by no means a complete list, but these are some of the major ones. And I think you've already figured out that one of the surveys we do, the types of surveys we do are control surveys. For instance, if you are creating benchmarks on your site, uh, relative to benchmarks further off-site, well, that's a vertical control survey. If you're creating horizontal reference points on your site uh, for the purpose of subsequent stages of your survey, then that's a horizontal control survey. We have to do that to provide the backbone on which we build the rest of our data. One of the early phases, if you're in the highway world, is a what we call an alignment survey or a corridor survey, determining uh, what are the what are the possible alternate routes for a particular um, strip type construction, whether that be a railroad or a pipeline or a highway or a utility uh, uh, electrical high line, some kind of easement for that. Those surveys tend to cover large areas and not necessarily a great bit of detail, but they are preliminary in nature. And then uh, perhaps the next step, once we start dealing with a uh, finalized alignment, we'll, we'll do boundary surveys, where we have to determine how what we intend to do affects landowners. A classic example is when the highway department needs to widen a highway, as there are a few projects every year in our area. When they need to widen a highway, they may need to purchase land from adjacent landowners in order to have the physical space on which to build those widened highway improvements. So boundary surveys often come after alignment corridor surveys. It's possible they can come before or during that phase as well. Floodplain surveys are especially a big issue in parts of the world like ours here in central Illinois where the water doesn't rush away so incredibly fast and we can have standing water. These floodplain surveys uh, take into account a lot of topographic data as well as hydrologic information relating to streams and watersheds. And uh, where we'll spend most of our time today is topographic surveys. A topographic survey, as your book points out, contains not only planimetric data, that is the horizontal positions of items on your site, features on your site, but elevation data that we can express as spot elevations or even as contours. Topographic surveys are the ones that contain the majority of the detail that you as an engineer will use in design processes or even interpret in the construction phase of your projects. So mapping, specifically topographic mapping, 
is the basis for the majority of engineering design you you may see. Topographic surveys can provide a handful of things, but I guess uh, one way I think of topographic surveys is this. They provide a spatial inventory of features on the site. Not just an inventory, which is a list that says we have 13 light poles and 42 parking spaces and three buildings and so many acres of pavement, but a spatial inventory. That is, we're showing that they those features exist and where in space they exist. And that space is a 3D space, not just a horizontal position, but a vertical position as well. It's it's one thing to say there's pavement out there, but it's a whole other thing to say there's this much pavement, so many so many square yards of pavement, and this is its location, its shape, its its slope, its uh, characteristics in 3D space, and that kind of information is uh, the backbone of the data you need for design. Now, this spatial inventory. Obviously, it's going to include things like terrain, the, the actual shape of the earth, whether that's a natural shape or a man-made shape. But the terrain is what we commonly think of the most when we think of topographic mapping products. Like maybe you've seen um, what we call quad sheets posted on the wall of a classroom or an engineering office. The thing that stands out are the contour lines that indicate the shape of the terrain. But uh, for engineering purposes, we're also going to show things that you can't necessarily see or they're not readily visible unless you know what to look for. Subsurface utilities. We may have evidence of those through um, portions of those utilities that are visible to ground surface. But the majority of that utility is buried. At the surface, we may have evidence, but the utility itself may be concealed, such as cable TV, uh, electrical power distribution, natural gas, water, sanitary sewer, storm sewer, fiber optic cable, telephone. All of those things may have surface evidence that indicates a subsurface utility. Of course, we're going to pick up surface features and improvements, and we'll talk about that more in a little while. We're also going to pick up aerial utilities. We don't want just the information on the ground. We want the information that's going to impact what we do. For instance, on uh, South Neal Street in Champaign, just north of Windsor Road, there is a, oh, i got to think, there's an Arby's and then a Culver's restaurant and then, I believe, a CarX uh, car care center. Well, if you look carefully there, there's a very large, um, very tall, high-tension power line running north and south over the top of those sites between Neal Street and the railroad there. Well, the presence of those aerial utilities is significant, so significant that there is an easement centered on that power line that makes the area directly underneath the power line unbuildable. That is, you can't build a structure directly under the power line. You can put in a parking lot and pavement, but you can't build structures there. Well, that's very, very important information. It's one thing to say, well, we we show on our topographic survey here there's a power pole, but that becomes evidence of... um, a legal uh, condition, uh, specifically a utility easement, they, that may restrict our ability to use certain portions of the site. That's very much an engineering design consideration. And, of course, our topographic survey is going to provide relative horizontal positions. Uh, these may be relative only to other features on the site, but it also may be relative to some horizontal datum. But... Uh, we should have good enough information with our survey that we can uh, simply measure on our survey between the objects that show on the survey and use that as a representation of the physical conditions in the field. 
just as we have relative horizontal positions, we have elevation differences. And this tells us uh, a lot of information about the way drainage will go, as well as considerations of um, slope for um, safe, safe pavement slopes for inclement weather or Americans with Disability Act uh, access or uh, even earthwork slopes making the site uh, cost-effective and safe. When we think of topographic surveys, we usually think of images like this. Uh, if you're just dying to know where this is, this is the site just outside the planetarium here at Parkland College, just south of the M1 parking lot, which is visible top of the drawing, and the perimeter road is visible along the left where you see the blue arrow. Well, just as I said we want to pick up utilities, you can see a few on here. This particular topographic survey was created from aerial photography. Dates back to uh, about Thanksgiving of year 2000. And you'll notice there are plenty of contours on here. The, the trees show up rather prominently, as you would expect in an aerial photo. But there may be some details that were not clearly visible in the aerial photo. Some things were. Some things were, were not, given the, given the scale of the photo. But we can use that kind of mapping process to show the presence of and the general location of things like light poles. Here at the blue arrow, you can see a little red star-type symbol. Well, and according to the legend of this particular survey, that's a light pole. And we also can show things like inlets. Well, what you don't see on this particular image is the pipes, the buried pipes that connect the inlets. Depending on the purpose of the survey, we may not necessarily need to do that. So we'll, we'll talk about the uh, intended use of surveys in just a little while. When we think of topographic surveys, uh, off, unless you're in the engineering profession, you don't think of an image like this. This is what we call a triangulated irregular network, and this is a plan view of a fairly um, high-relief site. There's a, a couple of hundred feet elevation difference in this particular survey, but you can't tell by looking at this top view, this plan view. But I want you to consider at the intersection of every little triangle, the vertex of every little triangle is a is an elevation measurement. So every node that is, every vertex of every triangle has a known position in three-dimensional space, X, Y, and Z. Well, this becomes the basis of the calculation process for determining contours. We do that basic process by hand as a part of this course using your survey data from your radial total station topo survey. Well, if we rotate that that plan view 3D data up into more of a uh, isometric view, you can see how this has quite a bit of relief to it. This is in some mountainous terrain. It appears to be flat, perhaps in a floodplain kind of condition on the lower right portion of the map. But now, look, uh, viewed from um, an oblique position. This, this wireframe network we call a triangulated irregular network, or T-I-N, TIN for short. This TIN now has some relief to it. Well, we use this TIN to generate contours. And what you see here are contours that are vertically separated by 100 feet from one line to the next. So it appears, if I can get my mouse to show up here, if this is one contour, there's one, two, three, four, five. It's about 500 feet elevation change from the top of this ridge down to what appears to be floodplain in the lower right. Again, this 3D view starts to show you that separation, but what we normally see in 
in the 2D plan world is an image like this with the contours, and we typically aren't going to show the triangles as a part of the plan. So what you'll see is the contours. Well, that helps us describe the terrain, and uh, it's not just the the ground surface as we see it that we're interested in expressing with contours, but we also uh, will perform hydrographic surveys, which are a specialized topographic survey of underwater surfaces. Perhaps you have, uh, perhaps you're somewhat familiar with this, maybe in different terms. You've heard of uh, depth sounding equipment. Maybe if you've gone fishing, you've got a fish finder, and it helps you determine the, the depth of the water that you're navigating. Certainly, large commercial vessels are dependent on that kind of sonar technology. Well, we combine that with not only sonar technology, but GPS technology to give us an X, Y, and Z position. Uh, not only of our, of our vessel on the lake, but the, the, the underwater surface that contains that body of water. There's a company out of one of the Carolinas called McKim and Creed, and I encourage you to chase down this website to uh, take a look at some of their applications of hydrographic surveying. It, a lot of these are, are small projects. Some of them can be fairly large, and they're for a variety of clients. But certainly it is the survey profession that has this particular capability. And the survey profession is, especially doing hydrographic surveys, is not limited to engineering companies such as the Team and Creed. We've had, we've done small hydrographic surveys right here in Champaign County, and I'll show you some results of that in a little bit. In fact, this particular image is uh, an aerial photo from Google Earth of Homer Lake, which is a Champaign County Forest Preserve District site in eastern Champaign County. In this particular image, north is at your left. And most of the uh, water surface area that you see was the site of a hydrographic survey that Parkland Surveying Technology students accomplished, um, I think it was about Five or six years ago, I think 2004, six in my mind is when we did that. But we went out with a simple motorboat with uh, some GPS hardware and some sonar equipment slaved together and a laptop mounted on board and collected data and generated this hydrographic survey. Now, just to help orient what you see here, if you look carefully, Around its most visible over here on the left side of the drawing, you'll see a blue line. That represents the water line. We surveyed that by walking the water line with a GPS rover. And we did a whole bunch of other topographic surveying outside the water line up on dry land using total station instrument methods and some GPS. And all those areas are denoted with green lines, but the yellow and orange lines represent contours under the water surface, that is, contours of the lake bottom. Well, to help you gain perspective on how useful this is, we, uh, let me indicate here, we'll, the next slide will show you a view looking generally this way, and just up here uh, above the blue arrow, above and to the right of the blue arrow, the, the long a uh, straight feature with several long parallel contour lines is the earthen dam that established Homer Lake. Well, here we're looking at an oblique view, and you can see the water line figuring prominently. In fact, my blue arrow here at the upper left is on that water line. And if you look carefully at the contours, you can see the the heavy or the brightest green line just outside the water line has an elevation of 650. The nearest one below it is 648. So we'll say our water line is about 649. The 
before we did this survey, the Forest Preserve District expected the, that the water uh, at the deepest part might be as much as 25 feet. Okay, so we've got 649 there at the water line. And if you look out here, this is the deepest area we detected as part of our survey. And it has a contour of 632. So if I remember my math correctly, 649 minus 632 puts, it a, puts us at a whopping 17 feet. That's about eight feet short of what the uh, Forest Preserve District expected. But it's probably indicative of uh, siltation that you would normally expect in a body of water of this type. Other other considerations worth noting is how much, uh, well, it's obvious when you look at it, but if you're looking at the survey, how much rise above the water do we have in the dam? So if I look at the dam over here, my water line was 649. It appears that uh, uh, about the highest point that you can see there where the blue arrow is, at about 654. So we've got about five feet of... Uh, of earth above the water line here at the dam. What you don't see on here is the concrete spillway that is visible uh, in little culture detail on the preceding aerial photo. Well, hydrographic surveying, we said, is a, is a specialized type of topographic survey. In our profession, there is uh, an emerging technology sometimes called 3D laser scanning, or as your handout says, ground-based LIDAR. LIDAR is a term like radar, except we use light, specifically laser instead of radio waves. And here's how it works. I want you to consider here in this photo, the, uh, the technician standing here with this instrument is going to make a 3D model, that bridge, in the... Uh, in the tablet PC that you see him holding in his left hand, he's going to use the instrument on the tripod here at the red arrow. We call it a 3D laser scanner. And think of it as a servo-controlled total station. And we can program it to scan left and right, up and down, and take uh, pulsed laser, laser measurements to any surface it can detect. We can specify the resolution. So if we really want to, we can tell it, you know, that bridge over there, make a make a measurement on every, on average, every square inch that you see. And it will return to us in 3D a cloud, a 3D cloud of measured points. I think you can see the, the similarity between uh, the photo and the image at the right. Now, the image at the right, is not a complete 3D model, but it's probably about 20 minutes worth of work for that particular instrument. The instrument can then be moved to the other side of the bridge or directly under the bridge or atop the bridge and perhaps a combination of all those locations to generate sufficient data with which we can model the surfaces created by this 3D point cloud and thus in, in in a 3D CAD environment, generate a highly accurate and highly detailed uh, as-built survey of things that could be fairly dangerous to measure. You know, if, if you were trying to use a conventional hands-on surveying methods to make a, a full map in 3D of that bridge without a laser scanner, you might keep three people busy for a week. Well, this, pro this fellow probably had the whole thing done in a morning. Granted, it's not cheap. That's a $100,000 instrument. But the return on the investment, if you can keep it busy, would be very, very, very powerful. I've given you another link here at the bottom of this page. Uh, Sanborn Mapping is a company that's based uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. They have locations all over the country, and they do not only aerial photography, but they are working in the ground-based LIDAR business as well. It's not their image in the photos here, but I encourage you to go to that, that link and you'll see some examples of the types of projects that they do with ground-based LIDAR. Here is some data. These are screenshots of data 
generated by a company uh, that has offices in Chicago, and these data came from their office in Burns Harbor, Indiana, which is real close to Gary, Indiana. I've got uh, a graduate that has worked for them. But I want you to notice, this This may look hard to interpret, but at the top, what we have is a scan taken from right about here where my mouse is. And you can see a street surface. These are vehicles. Looks like we may have some trees. Well, yeah, you can definitely see trees. You can see some features of buildings across the street and some power lines. But they set up a scanner, a 3D scanner in this area and scanned the street. Then, looking down the stairwell and into the structure that leads down to the subway under this street, if I recall correctly, this is in the Chicago area, they set control points in the stairwells, and they scanned the inside of these stairwells. And they had to do it from multiple positions. But all these occupied control points where the scanners sat were linked together in 3D. What was the purpose of their survey? Well, uh, there, for the project in question, there needed to be some borings or piles or something inserted in the ground, in the, in the footprint of the street, but they had to miss, with all certainty, the tubes that the trains ran through. So how do you determine where the tubes are going to be? Well, you can survey them from the inside. Well, how do you do that so that it's all laced together? Well, 3D laser scanning was um, a way to make it very economical and pretty accurate. Great thing about this, again, it's a 3D model. You do get some color recognition with newer scanners, so um, this some of the colors there are as sensed. Let's move on here. Here is a view of the same thing, and it is a view from the perspective uh, that is below the pavement and above the train tubes. Directly in the middle of the screen, you can see the stair tower, or the stair chamber that descends from below the center of the street down into uh, an access point, uh, a platform between the two tubes. This is a perspective that is enabled purely by uh, the 3D aspect of our, of our CAD file. So the scenario would simply be to say, here is a cross-section, a 2D cross-section that we can slice from the 3D model. And let's say I need to make some kind of uh, vertical structure penetrating the ground here but I need to miss the tube that's there on the left, and maybe upstream or downstream from that platform, I need to miss the two tubes. I need to do that with great certainty. Well, 3D laser scanning enables us to do this. So I want you to think as topographic surveying is not only surveying a ground surface. Topographic surveying more and more these days enables us to work in in three dimensions in ways that we hadn't considered before. Here is another example by DLZ Corporation as well. Uh, I think you recognize this is a bridge under construction. No, this isn't a picture at night. This is a laser scan from the middle of the day. In fact, over here beyond the bridge, you can see the, the uh, boom of a crane sticking up. Why do we have these dark areas? Well, those are areas that uh, I guess you could say were in the in the shadow of uh, what was visible. That is, uh, this we're looking down on the 3D model from a point higher than the uh, than the scanner's optical center. Therefore, if you were down at the scanner's level, which would be maybe about the same as this target you see on a tripod. In that area that is black would not be visible. Well, notice that we're picking up some incredible detail here. You might be able to make out the, the steel studs uh, atop the beams here. 
you can see the wrinkles in the burlap or the plastic that is covering um, perhaps a, a crushed stone subgrade or a concrete sleeper slab here. The little orange safety caps are visible on all these bars sticking up. Why were they doing this survey? If I recall correctly, they were making an as-built survey of the positions of the tops of the beams by which we can account for the dead load deflection of the concrete that is induced on the beams. That way uh, we don't build sags into the bridge. We accommodate the sags uh, prior to placing the concrete. But how long did it take them to do this? About 30 minutes. And look at the enormous amount of detail they have. Now, when we think about topographic survey, and let's, let's think in terms of the traditional sense, such as you're going out with a total station instrument and you're going to measure what you can see. How do you know what to measure? Well, the extent and the degree of your collected detail depends on the intended use of the survey. For instance, if you're doing demolition work or you're doing design that will lead to demolition prior to major construction, uh, the accuracy you need may be significantly less than for other scenarios. If your site is what we call a brownfield site. That is, it is a, a derelict um, industrial site. Maybe it's got abandoned buildings. Maybe it's got some uh, uh, soil contamination. Pretty much everything on the site is going to be torn down, hauled off or buried or remediated. And then it will be redeveloped as perhaps a, a, an upscale subdivision of some sort, commercial or residential. Well, if you've got four brick buildings on the site, just how detailed do you have to get to show that we're going to tear down this brick building? So the level of detail required for that kind of scenario is not near as demanding as if you're doing retrofit and modification. For instance, um, I've done a handful of surveys that were the basis for not only site design by civil engineers, but architectural design by architects. One of them is uh, over on by Marketplace Mall. There's a Gordman's department store. And uh, it was probably 10 years ago, I did a small topographic survey on the back side of Gordman's over on the Market Street side, on the, on the industrial side of the facility. They needed to add on. Well, I needed to have details that showed pavement, utilities, uh, structural features, walls, retaining walls, railings, um, door openings, all kinds of things so that the architects and the engineers could do their detailed design work from my survey. I had to come up with uh, floor elevations and ceiling elevations in order to uh, supplement what the, what the architects need. So a great level of detail, far beyond what you'd need for something like that demolition. New construction um, may be akin sometimes to the level you need for demolition, because if it's new construction, and uh, when you should, before construction, the site is 40 acres worth of bean field, well, you're simply making a topo survey of the of the the ground surface, and you may only be showing vertical accuracy on that ground surface because you know it's ten different foot. The most accurate part of that survey may be actually the boundary work. So the the intended use of the survey is going to govern how much detail you need and the depth of that detail, or the extent and the degree. So therefore, the party chief has to begin his survey work, his or her survey work, with the end in mind. That is, the survey crew chief, 
party chief needs to understand how will my data be used. And thus, they will make choices in the field um, that best meet those needs. So here are some things that um, we typically plan for that we need to collect as data in a typical topographic survey. Certainly our site improvements. A site improvement, of course, would be structures. Uh, not only buildings, but things like drainage drainage structures over on, uh, well, it's just south of University and west of, or east of First Street, there's uh, some of the final phases of one of the Boneyard Creek Improvements Projects, large basin there, lots and lots of improvements there, some of which are buried fairly deep. But you've got bridges, you've got uh, architectural features, you've got waterfall features. Every one of those is an improvement. The simplest pad to hold up a garbage can, concrete pad to hold up a garbage can, is an improvement. So we need dimensions of those things that we can either measure directly or extract from our survey data, a footprint area. Buildings, we would may probably need to know a height. I've measured the height of many buildings for uh, survey. Pavements, obviously, that's an improvement, and there's a lot to be said about pavements. There are so many details about pavements that, uh, um, that can be discussed, but that's beyond the scope of what I want to do today. Fences. Um, Sometimes fences are indication of, but not necessarily proof of, ownership. Well, um, those fences, even if they're going to be torn down, are still details we need to know about ahead of time. Utilities. Not only are we interested in the utilities on our site, but the ones that serve our site. Many times I've done topographic surveys for... Uh, a site that's maybe 200 feet by 200 feet. But I might be going a quarter of a mile in each direction, upstream and downstream, picking up information on storm sewer and sanitary sewer. Or I might have to go um, a quarter mile out of my way just to show the relative position of the nearest available water or gas line. So... In order for the designer to bring utilities to your site, to design those utilities, they have to know where they are. And they may not be on your site. Signs, obviously, are, are a big issue, especially if you're dealing with any kind of public highway. The presence of those signs is one thing, and their relative position is critical. That's just a... a a brief list of site improvements, certainly not intended to be exhaustive, but uh, if you, you're creative enough, you could probably interpret just about everything we do in those general categories. Landforms that we're going to pick up is in our details are in, going to include earth surfaces, not just natural earth surfaces, but uh, man-shaped earth surfaces, the embankments we create for for transportation networks or or flood control uh, systems, all of those shaped surfaces, especially the breaks, slope breaks in those surfaces, are very critical when you pick up waterways. Um, I mentioned earlier we can do floodplain surveys, and those waterways are very, very critical for us sizing waterway openings for bridges. Times perhaps you've seen small culverts out in the middle of nowhere replaced with little bridges that are maybe 30 feet long and 4 feet off the ground. Why? Because a waterway, a survey of a waterway indicated there's going to be sufficient flow that perhaps the old structure is inadequate. We have to replace it with a larger waterway opening structure. We also need to pick up vegetation. Again, if you're talking about wholesale demolition, we may simply indicate there's a large group of trees here, and they're all coming out. But if you are salvaging some of those trees, you may have to slog through the brush and say, okay, I've got an 18-inch oak here, and I've got a 24-inch uh, red maple, and I've got uh, a 12-inch silver maple. 
you may have to go so far as to identify size and species. That's a real big issue in some other areas. Some of our, some of our colleagues up in the Chicago area, and, and uh, I know of some in the Michigan area, um, spend a good bit of time doing tree surveys to inventory the trees that are on a particular tract prior to development. The site location, you might think of that as being a foregone conclusion. The site is where it is. But for the purpose of design and permitting and approval and review processes, often we have to show not only what's on the site, but where it is relative to the rest of the world, re relative to other boundaries, adjoining adjoining landowners. You want to show on your survey evidence, whether those are markers buried in the ground or or fences or sometimes mow lines or crop lines or uh, structure lines. Those need to show up on the survey in many cases. A vicinity map is essential for, especially for zoning issues, for uh, floodplain issues, for jurisdictional issues. And those are things that we have to communicate to the variety of agencies that interface with our engineering designs. An engineering a set of engineering plans is not only for the use of uh, the engineer, the contractor, and the project owner. It is also for the use of the the, um, the ready and simplified use of agencies that have to review and approve those plans and uh, subcontractors that are trying to arrange delivery. So that vicinity map, it may seem like a minor detail, but it is, it is an absolutely essential Piece of the information. A flood zone designation is not something you're necessarily going to determine in the field, but it is information uh, that combined with your waterway and uh, terrain survey can determine whether a particular structure may require flood insurance. Flood zone designations are are established through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the surveyors and engineers that you work with will likely have some experience with these. Names of the adjoining landowners are essential uh, in some jurisdictions, others per perhaps not so much, but uh, I've done several surveys in Indiana, and in the types of surveys I've done, I had to do boundary research on all the adjoining landowners. We're also looking for evidence of perhaps some problems, inappropriate land use. If we have knowledge of what the, the established zoning regulations are on the tract, we may discover some things that are incompatible with that. We may discover some, um, discover some issues that create design problems or create ownership problems or either expedite or slow down our project. I've been in situations where I've found potential environmental contamination. Someone is using the back part of their property perhaps as a uh, as a landfill. And maybe they intended only to just to put fill dirt in there, but pretty soon fill dirt had things like barbed wire and construction debris, and pretty soon we had vapor, baby diapers and food out there in that. Uh, what was supposed to be an innocuous dump, but has turned into some other issue. Sometimes it's uh, our environmental contamination is not something you can tangibly measure with uh, precision. I've had surveys in which working around an intersection on a on a wet rainy day you could get a good whiff of gasoline, but there's no gas station anywhere to be found. Well, sometimes it's the gasoline that is. Um, uh, perhaps has been leaked into the soil over a period of years, and you're now need a whiff of it. Is that survey evidence? Sure is. And as a survey crew chief, I would I would make a note somehow in my survey data saying at this location, at this time, in these conditions, I detected what could be gasoline vapors, which may indicate some kind of environmental contamination. And then recent construction activity. Um, 
sometimes we go out and find that uh, the site we are surveying has some changes that we did not expect. And this becomes an issue, especially when we're dealing with the types of surveys we call an American Land Title Association survey, in which a bank that is often involved in refinancing a commercial property wants a full, detailed survey that shows the assets that they are holding as collateral. Well, there has been some construction or demolition activity since uh, since the previous survey, then those are pieces of information we need to include. This particular site here that you see, of course, you may recognize this, uh, again, on the Parkland campus. This is where we do our station and offset basic topographic survey. And you can see, again, a lot of different information on here. You can see vegetation. You can see contours. You can see uh, pavement. You can see utilities. You can see pavement striping. Uh, this, The level of detail that you see on this is perhaps not as great as you might get if different methods were used. But again, this particular set of data came from aerial photography. And the aircraft was a couple thousand feet above the ground surface. So does that impact your resolution? Yes, indeed, it does. Uh, so ground ground-based methods may allow you to get greater detail. But did this particular survey satisfy the intended uh, the intended use? It, yes, it did. For for the planning purposes they needed, for the survey they wanted at the time, specifically relating to drainage issues, it was very, very sufficient. So what I want to share with you at the tail end here is some advice. The reason I share you this share this advice with you is um, my own experience without some survey background, in civil engineers can make their own lives harder than they have to be by uh, by not necessarily knowing how to request a survey and once they receive the survey data, what to do with it. So therefore, please, for not only your sake, the sake of the folks you work with, don't presume to know exactly how the surveyor is going to do the work. What will best serve you is to explain to your surveyor how you will use your requested data in your project. So if you say, listen, I need to know um, uh, position, horizontal position and elevation of the pavement from this approximate location to another point 1,300 feet away. I, I need an elevation at the center line, at each lane line, um, at the edge of pavement, in the flow line of the gutter, and the, the back of the curb. And uh, I need that for 1,300 feet. Well, that may be a fairly easy process to get. But it's it's best if you allow your surveyor or surveying staff to determine the best way to do that, rather than dictate, I want you to do this, this, and this, request the results you want, and that will communicate better to the surveyor and the surveyor's uh, technicians what their priorities are. I've worked for I've worked for folks that say, I just need you to go out and give me a couple of shots. Well, how are you going to use it? Well, I'm in a hurry. Can you just go out and do it? So I go out and do it do exactly what they asked for, and then I get back to the office, provide the information exactly as they asked for, and find out that, well, that's not going to do. Once once they say it's not going to do, then I find out what they're trying to do with it and realize that, well, I've done that kind of thing before, the, the task they're trying to do, and had I known that information, I could have given them what they needed 
which wasn't necessarily what they asked for. So explain what you need, how you're going to use the data more readily, do that much more readily than specifically saying how it has to be done. Leave that to the experts. So this is another real important uh, piece of advice. Uh, you need to work with that surveyor to define a cost-effective scope of the survey. Um, Cost-effective has an awful lot to do with the intended use of the data, the expertise in your company, the equipment available, the conditions under which you're going to do this, and um, and the estimated budget. So there may be there may be some really cool ways that the survey crew may prefer, but they may not be cost effective. It may be that the survey crew can go out and do it with GPS, and they may prefer to. But because of your billing rate for GPS, and because you may have to take the GPS equipment away from another crew that's doing a more critical task, it may be more cost effective to use a method that is not the crew's preferred method, but it's still something they're competent in. It may not be faster, but it may be cheaper. So please understand that uh, just doing the, doing the work is part of the battle. Doing it and actually turning a profit is is the stuff that separates the employed from the unemployed. And then, of course, allow your surveyor to employ the most appropriate field methods to produce your data. What you're asking for is data. Uh, let your surveyor uh, work with you to come up with the most appropriate uh, field methods. Most of all, you're learning. Um, your education really starts when you graduate. So therefore, ask questions. Ask a lot of questions. Don't assume that the folks are going to use terms that you've heard so far. I hear you know, I've been surveying a while, and I hear people use terms for something I know what it is, but I don't recognize their terms, and it sounds like a foreign language because they're from a different different area. Once I learn their terms, then it makes sense. Well, you're learning a new language, so ask a lot of questions and respect the experience of your surveyor and learn from the experience of your surveyor. Having been a junior engineer, I can say that the times when I earned respect of my, not only my peers, but my superiors, is when I asked questions instead of trying to prove what I knew. So don't try to prove what you know. Don't try to impress anybody. Work hard to learn. Work hard to learn and respect the experience and the expertise of the folks in the surveying profession, and they will be your ally. Thanks for your attention, and I'll be talking to you again soon.